Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Abdul Halim and today we will be talking about a fair trade policy than ever protectionist world, a conventional and Islamic perspective. Currently, we are facing a shortages of everything from agricultural goods to high-tech devices. This, moreover, this problem is exacerbated by the war between Russia and Ukraine. This problem creates an increase, an increase in price for those goods that are experiencing shortages. This problem can be analyzed through two perspectives, Western and Islamic perspectives. The Western perspective regarding this problem would be that the demand for these products far outstrip the supply of it. As more and more economies of different countries started to open up, few could have anticipated that there would be shortages occurring since it would be orthodox thinking that if the economy opens up, then the supply agents of the economy will begin operation as well in order to accommodate the demand, such as the reopening of factories and oil drilling sites. This shortage is due to several reasons when it comes to the topic of trade. Firstly, as global trade picks up again, several bottlenecks have occurred in logistics, from shortages in workers to containment measures at the ports of both the exporting and importing countries, especially in China, due to the surge in COVID-19 cases. The second reason is simply due to the concept of comparative advantage. As more and more countries adopt this concept, they will specialize in the production and export of the goods in which it possesses comparative advantage, such as low labor costs, and import the goods in which it possesses disadvantage in producing. Since in some countries, the domestic demand will outstrip the domestic supply, there is no choice but to import more and export less, or even out outright export ban. Thus, Western views would be to ensure that supply keeps up with the demand in order to end the shortages. As for the Islam Islamic perspectives, it possesses similarities to its Western counterpart. Islamic perspectives do take into account the law of, of demand and supply, but it adds another element which is the concept of falah. Falah consists of three things, which are survival, freedom from want, and power and honor. When it comes to Islamic economy, it studies human behavior's interaction with the resources of earth and its modes of resource utilization which may lead to falah. Thus, from an Islamic perspective, it will be of the interest of both the supply agents of the economy and the government to meet the demand of the economy as soon as possible in order to solve the shortage problems. And this is in line with one of the objectives of Islamic economics, which is achieving an, which is achieving an economic well-being within the framework of the Islamic moral norms. A notable number of Islamic scholars have made significant contributions in the field of trade and international relations. Some of them include Dr. Muhammad Najatullah Siddiqui, Dr. Volker Nienhaus, Abraham El Yudovic, and Habib Ahmed. Some of their contributions include Sharia rules governing economic transactions, capital and labor movement across borders according to the views of Islam, currency market and exchange rate determination through Islamic microeconomic and macroeconomic approach, and the ancient trade techniques of Muslim in medieval era such as the Komenda and Mufawada. As for conventional literatures, a number of notable scholars have made significant strides in the field of international trade including Ali Heksha, Bertil Ohlin, Raoul Prebish, Robert Mandel, and Marcus Fleming. Their contributions include the Heksha Ohlin theory, which lays the foundation for the concept of comparative advantage, Prebish theory, which stressed upon the need for industrialization for developing countries, and Mandel Fleming model, which outlines, which outlines how a nation can utilize fiscal and monetary policies to achieve both internal and external balance without any change in the exchange rate. Firstly, it is not a secret that an open trade policy provides more benefits than protection, protectionist policy. Therefore, especially for developing countries, it would be ideal to establish an agreement consisting of benefits to be gained, tariff reductions, access to new markets and products. Furthermore, as more countries become more integra integrated into the world trading system, they will be more competitive in producing the best of their products in order to ensure they do not lose their competitive advantage towards other countries. Furthermore, open trade policies encourage countries to adopt the best techniques and technologies in production in order to stay competitive and ultimately will be able to produce items with prices close to the world level. Case in point, when Taiwan in the 1980s controlled the quantities of foreign goods entering the domestic economy, the government utilized, this, utilized international prices to discipline the price-setting behavior of protected domestic producers. 
The government then demanded to know the viable reasons why domestic prices of protected items were significantly higher than international prices, especially in the case of imports to be used for export productions. By utilizing trade by permitting import, the government can ensure that domestic industry produces goods at a price near the world level. The second component that governments have to take into account when formulating a comp comprehensive trade policy is what would happen when unfavorable circumstances arise such as shortages. Thus, it is ideal for governments to adopt what is called a trade shock policy. The policy acts as a fail-safe when things go south. To elaborate, the government should constantly monitor the performance of the countries where it derived their main imports from. If a complication arises which could lead to shortages, the trade shock policy could be activated in order to prevent shortages from happening. For example, in the case of wheat shortages as a result of destroyed crops due to heat waves in India, the main importer of wheat from India should start, should start to outsource their wheat imports from other large wheat exporters such as China and Australia as soon as the news regarding the heat waves came. This signifies the need to have a diversified source of imports for all countries. However, if a shortage does occur before the government can react, the government has to formulate policies in order to solve the shortage problems as soon as possible. Policies such as price regulation through subsidies, temporary abolishment of permit import or even rationing of some goods. Another important aspect of a fair trade policy is adherence to international standards. As transparency is increasingly demanded when countries open up their ports to international trade, standards of their goods have to coincide with those set by the International Organization for Standardization or ISO. By avoiding the standards set by ISO or setting standards that are different from those of ISOs, this may cause a disadvantage to the other trading parties. For example, African exporters of textiles and clothing lose up to 50% of their potential export earnings. By some estimates, due to regulations set by the European Union that are different from the international standards set by the ISO. This could be avoided by ensuring that the trade policies signed by both parties enforce the needs to, to adhere to the international standards, which by, by violating it could lead to some form, of, some form of punishments such as a summon or contract nullification. However, one thing to be taken into account of, ISO does not involve in issuing standard certifications or any certif certification activities. They only develop international standards. Thus, trade policies have to take into account not only the international standards, but the certification bodies issuing the standards and their accredita accreditation. Through this measure, the goods traded will not only be considered uh, as high-quality products but can save countries millions in earnings as illustrated in the African exporters case. The final element in ensuring that the current trade policy can be continuously improved upon lies within education, particularly at a high level. The degree of economics in pretty much any university places an obligation on the students to complete a course on microeconomics, macroeconomics and econometrics. Perhaps another mandatory subject for the degree in economics would be international economy or subjects pertaining to international trade and trade theory. If such a subject is mandated, then the graduates of economics would be equipped with a basic knowledge on trade and would be able to formulate basic ideas on an ideal trade policy, unlike when the subject is optional. Another advantage of this action would be the graduates would be able to easily familiarize themselves on current trade issues and understand the advantages and disadvantages of it. Thus, it would be highly recommended for subjects such as international economy to be mandated as a compulsory subject for economics degree in higher learning institutions.